Good morning, everybody. I'm Pastor Gary Wright out here, one of the co-senior pastors here at St. Andrews United Methodist Church, and we're glad you could join here together, especially the, the ones that came through the thunderstorm to get here and uh, are here. We thank you for being here, and you can have an extra donut at the Holy Grounds as a reward. But we're also glad to have all those who are worshiping me from home today. Uh, we'll hope uh, that we, we know it's kind of gloomy outside, but we're going to have a very spirited worship service today. Got a few announcements for you before we get started on our worship. First of all, uh, tomorrow is uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. We'll be observing that here at the church, and so the church campus will be closed tomorrow. Also, I want to let you know that confirmation classes are, are, are st uh, start January 23rd for those who are 6th and 12th grade. Uh, there are in-person classes, and there's online cl options too. Today, there'll be a parent meeting, a uh, question and answer session today at 12.30 p.m. That'll be done through Zoom. So for more information about confirmation, or go to today's Q&A session or, re or visit saumc.life. Also, uh, every year we commit to becoming a host site for the Global Leadership Summit, and we're going to do that again for 2022 in August. So... Um, our church attendees get special discounted uh, prices, rates on that. So go to saumc.life uh, to get the discounted price. I know it's um, not until August, but it's uh, the earlier you get a ticket, the, the cheaper the tickets are. And then finally, we'll have a divorce care support group starting Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. If you are someone you know uh, in your family that's been through a divorce, you have the challenges of pain going through that, we encourage you to, encourage you to check into this group by going to saumc.life. We're glad to be worshiping here together. So let's begin our worship. I want you guys to stay and join with us this morning as we begin.
once again, I just want to welcome everybody here. I know there's probably a lot of us that are joining online instead of in person this week just because it seems like you cannot walk past somebody without catching something. So um, I'm looking forward to everybody being able to be back and for us to have a full stage again up here. But for right now, uh, let's just continue in our worship and know that no matter what we're going through, no matter what we're facing, that our God is greater than that. And we know that he's walking through us with everything. Walking through everything with us. He's not walking through us with it. He's working through us. <laughs> Water you turned into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you And into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you, none like you, cause our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. come before you this morning. We thank you that you are with us through everything. And that we can come and lift you up even on a gloomy day that we know that you are walking right beside us. No matter what we're facing, no matter what's on our mind, no matter where we've come from or no matter what we did, 
uh, even last night or whatever, Father. We know that you're always standing there with your arms open, ready to accept us, and we praise you for that. And I pray that this morning our response would be to offer ourselves to you, and not just here in worship, but in a way that uh, we're laying down our lives and picking up what you've asked us to do, which is to love others. Father, as we come before you this morning, we worship you for what you've done. I pray that uh, the words of this song wouldn't just kind of slide past us and when we move on, but we think of everything that you've done for us, the ways that you've been faithful to us. And I pray that that would cause us to realize that our only response should be 
to honor you with our lives. I pray this morning as we continue in our study about uh, how we see ourselves about body image, I pray that uh, we would really be listening to the words that, uh, that you have for us this morning so that we can become more like you. In your name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, St. Andrews. My name is Jane Rideout. I'm one of the co-lead pastors along with my husband, Gary, and I'm so happy to be worshiping with you today. I know many of you are at home, and so I just want to do a special welcome to you. Um, I had a friend say recently they saw a meme that these days when it comes to COVID, it's like playing dodgeball. Um, but be careful because the crowds have gotten very thin, so you're going to probably get hit. And so I applaud your caution, or just because of many other reasons as well. And for those of you who are here, I'm also excited that we can be in the same room, that we can be worshiping together. We all need each other. Whether we're here or at home, we still continue to be the body of Christ, and we need to be together. So this past week, um, this past Sunday, we started a new sermon series called Body Image. And if you were not here, we, we qualified it with a little bit of science, like why would we talk about that in worship? And we talked about how scripture can really enlighten us in even areas of a negative body image. So I want to just give you a really very brief summary of last week. Who's actually impacted by body image, negative body image? Um, we shared more last week, but very briefly I'll say girls by the age of six start to worry that they are going to be are feeling insecure about their bodies. One-third of adolescent boys will practice some sort of inappropriate behavior like vomiting or taking laxatives so that they're thinner. That's boys. 80% of young men in college are not satisfied with their physique, which is actually when you look your best usually is in college and they're, they're unhappy. Um, men in their adult lives will often um, inappropriately put an emphasis on their workout schedule over other important issues. Um, women will carry poor and negative self-esteem, not only um, into their 20s and 30s, but studies show now it actually increases after 66, their entire lives. And the last one is that even senior men struggle with negative body, self-body image because they're focusing on their lack of strength and all the realities that go with part of aging. So it's an issue. But it's not enough that people are just kind of discouraged. It turns out that negative body image actually leads to some health issues that are quite serious. So when you don't deal with that, it can also lead to images, issues like poor self-esteem, social, social isolation, eating disorders, depression, anxiety, poor job performance, and even financial strain, plus some other things as well. Um, these are not just bothersome, they impact our health. And so we need to look to scripture to figure out how do we deal with this? How do we get healthy? How do we move towards a healthy self-image of who we are? And last week we focused on um, Psalms 139. I encourage you to go home and read the whole thing from the top to the, the, the bottom because it really taught us about um, who God is and that God knows us. But not only does he know us, he sustains us. 
and loves us. And, and, the, and it's what we learn in this is that God, because he knows us, he asks something of us. He asks us to be um, deeply honest with him about what we feel about life and our struggles, but also to be deeply dependent on him to help us through those struggles. So that was our focus last week. But this week we're going to kind of narrow it down a little bit more, and we're going to depend on the work of Drs. Les and Leslie Parrott. They're Christian psychologists. And they, when they talk about good emotional men mental health, they talk about three things that all of us need to embrace, our profound significance, our unswerving authenticity, and self-giving love. And we're going to start today and focus on profound significance and what that means to us. But we're going to start out with reading a parable or a section of a parable. It'll be familiar to you. And what I want you to focus on is the attitude of the younger son in this very um, familiar parable. So I'm reading to you out of Luke 15, verses 11 through 21. Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. A younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the inheritance. And then the father divided his estate between them. And soon afterwards, the younger son gathered everything together and took a trip to a land far away. There he wasted his wealth through extravagant living. And when he had used up his resources, a severe food shortage arose in that country, and he began to be in need. He hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from what the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my fi father's hired hands have more than enough food, but I'm starving to death. I will get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and you, and I no longer to be, to be deserved to be your son. Take me on as one of your hired hands. So he got up and he went to his father, and while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and was moved with compassion. And his father ran to him and hugged him and kissed him. And then the son said, Father... I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. We're going to stop there today. There's more to that story. You can read that this afternoon if you would like in, in Luke 15. But we want to stop there because we want to think a little bit about what it means to have profound significance. And where does that profound significance come from? And the first thing I want you to look at is this story itself in this young son. You have a very immature, self-centered, selfish young man who's decided he's not willing to wait for his parents' inheritance, which would normally come to him when they passed away. So he does a very um, horrible thing. He goes to his dad and he said, can I have my inheritance early? Now, in this day and age, that's not probably unheard of. Uh, a, a child might say to their parents, would you give me my inheritance now because I want to start a business or I, I think I want to try to do this, and a parent might consider doing that. But in the ancient society, when a child said that to their parents, what they were basically saying was, I wish you were dead. I wish you had already passed away because I want my inheritance now. And so the father, in spite of the cruelty of the son, gave him his money, and the son went off and acted like an idiot. He went through all of his money until eventually he realizes he's starving, that the pigs he feeds are better fed than him. And he doesn't do anything noble. He just heads home, runs back to his dad, who's been always very gracious with him. But I want you to note something really important about this scripture. And it begins in the very last statement. Because I believe, again, this is just a parable, but this is when the young son finally begins to move towards what we are going to call profound significance. And that moment happens when he says to his dad, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. That's the most important part of this story today. This, there's hope for the son the moment he came and he confessed something that is so deeply true of every one of us, whether you're at home or whether you're here in the room. None of us deserve to be loved by the father. You see, 
This parable was taught by Jesus to teach people what their relationship was with God. And this is key. The son finally realized he didn't deserve anything. But instead, his father had chosen to love him. How often do we think of ourselves based on our accomplishments, based on what we've done? Or on based on the mistakes we've made or all the places that we've messed up. How many of us are judging ourselves based on that? How often do you look in the mirror and you don't like what you see and you think, man, if I could just have stopped eating all that dessert, if I could just stay away from chocolate, or if I just didn't love beer so much, or whatever it is you say to yourself when you look in the mirror. You blame yourself, right? You blame yourself for all your disappointments you blame yourself for all the ways you don't measure up. Or, on the other side, you give yourself far more credit than you need to. Because profound significance comes to all human beings for one reason, one reason alone. Because the Father chose to love us. So last week we learned we're known by God, we're sustained by God, but this week we learned we're unconditionally loved by God, not for anything we've done to earn it. Whether we've messed up or we've been the perfect human being, that does not earn God's love. We simply have God's love because the Father chose to love us. That gives us profound significance. If you were to look um, a little further into the, the New Testament, we have the Apostle Paul using... Um, Roman adoptive language. And he does this for a reason because he wants us to understand where our profound significance comes from. And he says, this is why I kneel before the Father. Every ethnic group in heaven or on earth is recognized by him, by God. I ask that he will strengthen you in your inner selves from the riches of his glory through the Spirit. I ask that Christ will live in your hearts through faith as a result of having strong roots in love. I ask that you'll have the power to grasp love's width and length and height and depth together with all believers. I ask that you'll know the love of Christ that is beyond knowledge so that you will be filled entirely with the fullness of God. God. That is a mouthful of a scripture. But what it's trying to remind us is how absolutely huge the love of God is for each one of us. It's so beyond anything we can measure. It's hard to wrap our brains around. The ancient theologian Augustine said, God loves each of us as if there was only one of us. I mean, think about that. He loves each one of us as if we're it. That's hard for us to understand because we're so busy judging what we see in the mirror or judging what we don't accomplish or don't do or judging ourselves based on all the wrong stuff. We are profoundly loved. So last week we said that we were going to go to the, to the work of the, the doctors, um, Dr. Um, Dr. Les and Dr. Leslie Parrott. And they gave us these three steps to good emotional health, health so that we could better deal with our poor body image. And um, the first one was profound significance. And they give us more, and I want to go deeper into what we can do to live into this profound significance. Because just because you know you're loved by God, we said that last week, just because you're known by God, you know God knows you, doesn't mean that always gives you good self-body image. And just because you know you're loved by God, doesn't mean that you still love what you see. You see, God always invites us into the process of healing. He always allows us to be a part of the process. We live by faith, we ask by faith, but then he invites us in and says, it's going to take a little work on your part. And so... And, and what happens when he invites us into the work, we mature. It's of so much more value because we're a part of the process. So the first thing we're going to challenge ourselves today is to listen to our self-talk and what we do about our self-talk. Now, self-talk is not what you hear when you're maybe in the house alone and you decide to just talk out loud because you're all by yourself. That's what extroverts do. They get alone. They like noise, so they just talk out loud. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about 
the internal talk that nobody else hears but you. The things you say to yourself when you look in the mirror, the things you say to yourself when you put on your pants and you can barely zip them up, like what is the shameful thing you may say to yourself? Or when you're, feel, when you're comparing yourself to somebody else's body, what do you say to yourself? You see, we all have self-talk. And interestingly, there's enough knowledge about how the brain works that it, we, we know that whatever we say to ourselves over and over and over, we will eventually stop being aware that we're saying it, though we're still saying it to ourselves. We'll just keep it. It's almost like we'll get into a rut in our brain, and we'll just keep repeating the same thing over and over and over. And then one day, you may look drastically different, but you still look in the mirror, and you're still like, what a disappointment, you know? Because that's how our brains work. But the thing is about self-talk is that we're not a slave to our self-talk. In fact, the opposite is true. We can totally control our self-talk. We actually have the power to change the negative self-talk that we whisper to ourselves constantly. Many of us don't realize that. We think that we have no control, but we do. God gives us the power to change it, but it requires work. Because it's easy just to fall into old habits. But if you want to truly change, the science says you can. So I want to encourage you that... I'm not a scientist, and I'm not going to be, I, I read a few things, I thought, oh, so I'm not going to go there and try to explain this to you. You need to Google and figure out how to improve your self-talk, but I want to give you just a little wisdom in your journey of how to do it, because there's good science-based books that will teach you how to do it. You can find good articles on, on the internet for this. But here's just a little bit of boundaries and guidelines for you. The first thing you need to understand in your self-talk is that it's not all about just saying, you're great, <laughs> okay? That would be nice, but the reality is that your self-talk should not just be overly positive. <laughs> it needs to be real. Just because you're saying every day, you are outstanding, well, this reality is we're all human. That your self-talk isn't about just saying how great you are. The self-talk needs to be real and rational. Now, I will say this, though. Real and rational in the sight, in, under the umbrella of profound significance, right? Because what is real and rational under the sound, prof, um, under, under the um, profound significance? Think of it this way. If someone were to say something about my husband or my children, I will go off on you. I won't act like a pastor. I'll go all mama bear. You say something because I don't, those three people, my heart is so there with those three human beings. Now think about how God feels about us when he looks at us. It turns out he loves us even more. We have profound significance because he just is like, whoa, you are amazing. And that's of every human being. He just delights in us. So who are we to look into the mirror and say, oh, you messed up, God. So when you talk to yourself, your self-talk, it should be logical, but it should be under the understanding that we are loved by God, that we're not, as my dad used to say, God doesn't make junk. I hated when he said that to me. But there's truth there. We're loved by God. Because we're loved by God, we can be logical and truthful about ourselves without being harsh and negative. Here's also a couple other things that I want you to know. We choose our responses to ourself. Our responses do not choose us. So you have the power to overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit, by understanding you were loved by God. To understand, you have the power to overcome negative self-talk. Number two, no thought can dwell in our minds without our permission. Okay, think about that. Any no negative self-talk, you're allowing it. And God says, you know, this faith journey, are you fully in? In this faith journey, are you, are you putting me first? You know, Jesus goes off and he, and he talks about how we should love family, excuse me, that we should love God more than family. And you're like, is, is Jesus anti-family? No, 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 no. Jesus just really understands this. Our relationship with him should come first. 
Family is second. You can still love your family, hang with them and all that, but really family, God comes first. And if God comes first, you need to really live into how God sees you and me. That, that'll be groundbreaking when you begin to really not allow yourself to be negative, but determine you're going to be real and loving when you look into the mirror. And then the third thing is our personal value is never equal to our performance. And no matter how bad we mess up, we're still loved. You know, we might be mad at ourselves for it, but what do you say in response? You give yourself a break because God gives you a break. You remind yourself you're loved. Just remember, you have the power to change the self-talk. The second thing, and this is probably even harder than the first, and it's going to require work, is letting the past go. You did not get to pick which family you were going to be born into. Some of you hit the jackpot, and some of you did not. But here's the thing that is true of all people. Whether you have perfect parents or imperfect parents, and trust me, we all lean more towards the imperfect, you carry with you a level of, bo- um, of, of um, family baggage. I'm trying to think of the word that I was using. Yeah, family baggage. In fact, I'm going to give you the Ten Commandments to kind of define what I mean by family baggage. Do you know that there's Ten Commandments of what most families will instill in you about certain issues in your life? Okay, I'll try to explain this. So the Ten Commandments of families are around these items. Money, Conflict, sex, grief and loss, expressing anger, family relationships, excuse me, family and relationships, attitude towards different cultures, success, and feelings and emotions. Now, what I mean by family baggage is that your family instilled in you a culture around those 10 things. They've instilled that into you, and you're not even aware of it. But it's where your attitudes and your thoughts come, how you deal with life. And this is your family baggage. And some of it you're going to think, oh, that's not a bad thing. But the reality is it probably holds you back from living into your profound significance. It's most likely not going to be healthy. It's just kind of what your family passed on to you. They're a little gift to you. Let me give you some examples. Your family maybe taught you that the only way you'll ever have power is if you have money. Well, maybe you want to work for a nonprofit, but you can't do that because you want power. And, well, you'll have no power if you don't make a lot of money. Or your family might teach you that um, you should avoid all conflict. Don't talk about it. We don't talk about that in our family. We just, nope, we don't do that. You just deal with it. We're all going to put on a little happy face. We don't, we don't do conflict. Or you come from a crazy family like mine was, and the minute you have a thought or a disagreement or dislike of another person in your family, you should say it and explain why you're saying it. Like you should just let it all hang out, total honesty. Neither are healthy. They're called family baggage. In relationships, it might be never show your vulnerability. Be strong. That's true of a lot of men. Never be vulnerable. That's actually family baggage as well. It's a cultural thing that's taught to you. Um, one might be for expressing anger. That sarcasm, sarcasm is appropriate. It's not it's hurtful, it's mean. But a lot of you have been taught, like, no, no, that's okay. That's how you deal with your anger. And then the last one is, no, I think that is the last one. There's many more. I'm sure some of you are sitting there thinking about it. You're probably most likely thinking about your spouse's issues. But you're thinking about it. You're, you're thinking about examples of like, oh, yeah, that's probably not good. That's, that's the kind of thing when you first get married and you start like, pointing things out like, why the heck do you do that? Well, it's probably from your family. It's your family baggage. Now, I would like to say that um, you can just easily release it, but it's going to take a little more. To release some of your family baggage, you're going to have to take a really brave step. You're going to have to find either like a really intimate, trusted friend, maybe a mentor, spiritual guide, a therapist, a counselor. 
Um, not your spouse. Someone said that to me at the last week. Please say not your spouse. Don't try this with your spouse. But you're going to say to them, be honest with me. How do you experience me? That's why you want to do it with someone you really trust, someone that you know loves you. But how do you experience me? Because most of us aren't aware how we carry our family baggage with us. We're not aware of how hurtful it is to everybody around us. And that'll be the beginning of your journey. We, we said at the very beginning last week, we're not going to all be fixed by the end of the series. But we need to be aware. There's work to be done in our lives. In order for us to live into the profound significance that God is freely offering us this unconditional love, we have to be willing to look at our stuff. We have to be willing to do the work to say, we're going to put God first. And if this is what God sees when he looks at me, then this is what I'm going to embrace. I'm going to make this more about God than I do about making it about me all the time. And I'm going to do some work that I don't maybe want to do that might feel painful, that might feel like it's opening up some wounds. I'm not sure I want to go there. But I'm going to do that because I am loved by God, and he wants me to be free. The name of this series, or this, this message today is that we were made for freedom. And, and I think we kind of know that when we begin a relationship with Jesus Christ that he sets us free, that we, we don't, we're no longer under the, um, the umbrella of this power of sin in our lives. And so we, we accept the, the love that God freely offers us and we accept it and we're told we're free and then we think, yeah, but I don't feel very free. And that's really when the work of sanctification comes. That's when we begin to do the work. But it's work to be done. And the Holy Spirit is doing the work. But the Holy Spirit always says, work with me. And we can always decide, no, nope, Holy Spirit, do it in your own time. And I'm going to put my heels into the ground and I'm going to resist it. Or we can say, all right, Holy Spirit, do your thing. And I'm going to participate. And I'm going to go with the flow. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit work through me because I want to get rid of this negative self-talk. I want to move beyond my past. I want to be able to look into a mirror and thank God. I want to stop comparing myself. I want to be content and satisfied. Isn't that what we all want? Isn't that what we all long for? But God's going to require us. To work with him. But the, by the power of his Holy Spirit, he will do the work. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Will you pray with me? Loving God, I'm so grateful that you just never give up on us. That you keep challenging us to move forward, to do better to really live into what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Tomorrow, as many of us will have the day off, I ask that you'll continue to whisper to us on this holiday of remembrance of the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. Merciful God, keep reminding us that we are called to do what he did, to, to work and to fight for justice, for mercy, for freedom. Speak to our hearts and give us eyes to see the places where we can do your work. And loving God for all the places in our lives that we're just struggling, where we just feel like life feels too hard, or maybe we have a, a test ahead of us or a treatments we're taking, or just, just in general maybe feeling down. I ask, loving God, that you will help us to have that extreme honesty with us that we talked about last week. And then simply have extreme dependence on you, looking to you and asking you to help us. We thank you, God, that you see something in us that we don't always see. And we thank you that you will be with us on this journey. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I love the story of the prodigal son. And as, as Jane was speaking about it, it was just a reminder that God ex accepts us as we are. 
even when we've created some great offense against him. That's the image that Jesus was trying to give when he tells the story of how the father accepts his son who completely rejected him. And he doesn't, he doesn't try to say, he could have like taken this stand and said, well, it's my right to throw you out. It's my right to not bring you in and provide for you anymore. But instead, he accepts him as his son because it's his son. That's who he is. And as we were talking about, as we're talking about body image, I just thought that's how we should see ourselves before God. And I think we don't really see ourselves that way as our identity being one of his children. And so we, we don't feel worthy sometimes. And the story that Jesus tell, is telling is, was actually a popular story at the time. Uh, it's actually recorded in other faiths as well in, in Buddhism. It's one of the Lotus Sutras or something. But in that, the son returns and the father makes him work his way back up. And eventually before he dies, the son finally becomes a son again. And what Jesus was saying is, no, that's not how God works. The way that God works is he loves you and he accepts you because you are his and you belong to him. Now, tomorrow's uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and he used to tell a story about uh, driving through Chattanooga. I don't know if any of you have ever done that late at night, but it's super dark, right? It's not the most fun place, and it's really hilly. And he said he was dr- his, his brother was the one driving, and he was riding, and his brother got sick of all the people flashing on their high beams or, or not turning them off when they came past. Very annoying, right? Anybody had that happen, right? So two of us, awesome. So... So uh, so he said that his, his brother goes, man, I'm so tired of this. The next person that comes past, if he, doesn't, if he doesn't turn off his brights when I'm going past, it makes it so difficult to see. He said, I'm going to turn mine on, and I want to quote it because it's kind of it's funny. It shows how angry uh, his brother was. He says, I know what I'm going to do. The next car that comes along here and refuses to dim the lights, I'm going to fail to dim mine and pour them on in all of their power. Right? Don't you feel like that sometimes? And then Dr. King quickly said, oh, no, don't do that. There'd be too much light on this highway, and it will end up in mutual destruction for all. Somebody's got to have some sense on this highway. And he told the story later on as, a, as how we can de-escalate a situation or how we can be the first to relent in a situation. You know, we've all heard stories. There's one that happened here in Florida where somebody parked in a handicapped parking spot real quick to run into a gas station. Somebody got mad, went over and talked to his girlfriend who was in the car. The guy got mad that the other guy talked to his girlfriend. Somebody ends up getting shot because somebody parked in the wrong parking spot, right? So a guy's in prison, a guy's dead. And you've got to think to yourself at any point, if one person would have relented or said, you know what, maybe that guy's just in a hurry, instead of standing his ground and having his rights that he, you know, feels justified in, and instead is willing to lay down his rights, like what we've seen the example of Jesus doing with us and accepting us, you know, that could have diffused the situation at any point. So I think that when we're behaving the most like Christ is when we're willing to lay down our rights, to lay down the things that we may feel entitled to for the sake of another person, because really that's how we're lifting God up, right? Because it's not natural for us to do. And so I think that as we're singing that next, this next song, um, that's just where my mind is, as we're talking about this, we see so many people angry about so many things every single day. And it's like, what if you recognize that that is another person, that's somebody that God values just the way that we want to be valued. And maybe we can just take the time to understand them instead of, you know, always being on the offense. So this morning, um, if you would like to give to this ministry, uh, you can give through the Church Center app. You can also give through saumc.net and uh, online there. And then also we have a basket in the front and we have a basket in the back. And you can get up and move around during this next song. Also, if maybe there's something that you heard during the message today, you want to come up to the front here and just get before God and pray, uh, get out of your seat. Maybe that helps you to be in that posture. Uh, the, The rails open up here as well as we sing this next song. down my rights lay down my life I will abandon all of my pride forgive 
close my eyes away from myself you become greater I become less you be lifted high you be I belong to you. I am nothing without you. You be lifted high. You be lifted higher. I belong to you. I am nothing without you. morning, as we're thinking about body images, we're thinking about our identity, let's think about lifting God up, you know, because it's not, the point of this isn't like to glorify ourselves and think about how great we are, but to be able to come before God and fulfill the things that he has for us, because we see ourselves the way that he sees us and the way that he created us to be. So let's, uh, why don't you stand with me and join me as we sing this last song before we uh, finish our time of worship this morning. to age he stands 
pray. Father, we love you. We do lift you up and we say that you are great, that you are above all else. And I pray that we would live our lives that way by listening to the teachings that you've given us, by following the example of your son and by honoring you with our lives. And I pray that uh, we would go out and we would share your love with every person that we see this week, that we'd be the first to offer forgiveness, we'd be the first to, uh, to relent in a difficult situation that we would see people the way that we want to be seen with that image that we have. And that is as your children. In your name, amen. Just one final thing I want to remind you that there is coffee with the pastors under the gazebo out there. So even if it's sprinkling a little bit, you know, you can still, you can still have, that, have that covering. So uh, if you can meet with uh, Gary and Jane out there, if you're a visitor, if you'd like to get to know some people, uh, that's the way to do it. So I uh, pray that you all have a good week.